Hey there, uh, it's time to keep going with our lessons in two-dimensional kinematics. We are all the way to uh, type two projectiles. So in the last lesson, we looked at what happens when things fly through the air. Maybe they start up on a cliff, you get your wily e. coyote running off the cliff and then uh, parabolically arching towards the ground. Um, we're going to call these type 2 projectiles, they're just going to look a little different, but all the same rules are still going to apply. Um, and so in this one here we got uh, Travis Pastrana apparently broke, uh, broke a world record by jumping a rally car 87 meters over the water in uh, at Long Beach. From the video, measure how long is airborne and answer the following. So I'm going to grab my uh, phone here and do a quick measure as we see exactly how this works. Okay, things are looking good. On the straightaway. And here he goes. It's up. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. So, well, I have a few questions about that uh, landing pad they gave him, but um, that's maybe for a different video. So I found, I measured it was right around 2.25 seconds that he was flying through the air from the point he lifted off to the point that he landed um, in that car. So we want to figure out, we want to try and calculate what was his maximum height. So he launches up in the air and he's hanging up in the air. What at that highest point, how high up was he? And then also, how fast did he have to be going in order to hit that jump? Because that's a really important question. You saw that he t hit that first jump and landed on the landing pad, which is kind of a mirror image. And if he goes too fast, he's going to overshoot it. And if he goes too slow, he's going to land short. So I, I bet he had to do some pretty important calculations to figure out exactly how fast he needs to be going to make that happen smoothly. So, uh, so we're going to check that out. So first thing, of course, we're going to do is we're going to draw pictures. Um, I'm just going to draw, I got a little jump here. Okay, and then I've got my, my car, which looks exactly like that, beautiful. And it just kind of hucks it off that. And like I said, there was kind of a landing pad, kind of a mirror image jump. And he kind of he kind of went up in the air and then came down. Now, I'm going to make a few simplifying assumptions, which may not be exactly true, but I think are going to be pretty fair considering the situation. I'm going to assume that he left from the exact height that he landed at. If he didn't, this would be a slightly more complicated problem. We could still figure it out, but um, but it would take a little bit uh, more math. We'd have to know more uh, information as well. Um, and so you can see that first question is asking, what's his maximum height? So what is that right there? Which, um, that's like a displacement, isn't it, right? So I'm gonna label that D. Um, and then um, I'm gonna put in the information that I know. So for example, uh, this, um, length here from the distance that he jumped and that is also a displacement so I'm gonna label that D. And at this point um, you should be wondering what's going on, in fact you probably already know there are two different displacements. He went up in the air but he also went forward and so we need to differentiate these two things. So I'm gonna call this D that how far he went in that direction, I'm gonna call that DX because that's just how far he went in like the, the horizontal forward direction. And this one right here I'm going to call that dy. Now it's important to notice with dy um, at that maximum height, that doesn't happen at the end of the jump like his maximum dx does. Those happen at different points in time. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so just like we saw with the type 1 projectiles, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a chart, like a little table here, and we're just going to label it x and y, and we're just going to use it to keep things separate okay so um, because the independent uh, because the perpendicular vectors are independent we want to make sure we don't mix up our DX and our VY or something like that now just like before on the X side of things things are simple in in the X world because there's only VX and DX and T and the reason why there's only those two variables on the X side is because Objects in uh, projectile motion are moving at a constant velocity in the horizontal direction. They're not accelerating at all. There is an acceleration in the y direction. So because of the acceleration in the y direction, I have to use all of my big three variables. I got vy, vy naught, ay, dy, and t. So t is a little bit more complicated because of that acceleration. The good news is, is this is on Earth. And so the acceleration in the y direction on Earth is always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So I know one of my variables all the time right away for sure. Now it um, might be useful for you to just hit pause in the video and just see how much of this chart you can fill in um, before uh, before I do it for you. Just kind of think about what you know and what you don't know. Um, 
Okay, assuming you've done that, uh, I am going to fill in my time because uh, I measured the time was two point. I got two point two five seconds is how long he was airborne. That's the total time, all the way up and then all the way down again to when he landed. And my DX here, this that's this right here. That's uh, that's my eighty seven meters. That's how far he flew horizontally. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sort of at a little bit of a loss because here's the thing this time right here on the Y side I've got a little time variable on the Y side but this time is not the total time it took for him to fly through the air because the maximum Y displacement here happens right in the midway point really it's only halfway through his trajectory so I'm going to use a little trick here that's going to help me to solve the rest of the problem is when I look at the Y variables, I'm going to look at it at what I call T1 half, which is the exact halfway point of the trajectory. And so in order to then find the T1 half time that I can use on this Y side, I just take my 2.25 and I divide that by 2. So my time in the Y dimension is going to be 1.125 seconds, okay? And this is true because this is like a parabolic arc up and down. And we know that parabolas are symmetrical. It takes the same amount of time to get up to the top as it does to fall back down. And we know this because the acceleration of slowing you down on the way up is the same as the acceleration speeding you up on the way down. And you travel the same displacement both up and down. This all, of course, is assuming there's no air resistance. But if there is no air resistance, time up, up equals time down, which means uh, you're at your maximum height right at the halfway point. Okay, because I've chosen this, because I, I've chosen to look at this halfway point, this also actually makes my life simpler in other ways as well, which might not be immediately obvious. We, um, we don't know the initial velocity. Um, the initial velocity in the y direction was, was how fast he launched off of that ramp. So if I was to break down, if I was to, um, maybe I'll take this, this velocity here, this velocity vector. Okay, there's v total. If I break that down into components, and what that means is that's my total velocity vector going in this direction. That's got a certain amount of velocity in the x direction, and I call that vx and it's got a certain amount of velocity in the y direction. I'll call that vy naught. Now this is a skill that we're gonna use quite a bit um, in, throughout physics, and especially when we talk about projectiles. We call it breaking into components. With the type one projectiles, you didn't really have to do that because you went running off the cliff or you threw the ball horizontally and there was no x and y in the total. In this case, the total velocity, the total initial velocity is both forward and upwards. And so I'm gonna break that down into components. Notice when I do that, these components, they, they form a right angle triangle, right? Because the x and the y have to be perpendicular to each other. So again, the way you do that skill is you draw your total vector, v total, and then go make a little dotted arrow as far as you need to in the x direction so that you can turn 90 degrees and finish off that triangle, okay? Now, as I was saying, I don't know Vx and I don't know Vy initial. So these are two, two things I don't know. But, and this is the important thing, I am looking at this car when it's at its maximum height. And so, what is happening with the car at that maximum height? Well, I'll ask you this question, is it moving? And the first answer that might pop to your head is no, but it is. It is still moving. The trick here is that it's only moving forward. So the car's still flying through the air, but it's flying through the air at that point perfectly horizontally, which means it's not moving up or down, which means at that point, the Y velocity is zero. So because I chose my halfway time, I can set Vy equal to zero. And that's really important because look at this. Look at all this information I've got here. Now I can solve everything on the Y side and everything on the X side um, if I want to. So for example here, when I try and find Dy, which is my other unknown, I've got three other variables to work with and so I've got enough information, okay? Now, um, right off the top of my head, I can't think of a formula that I can use to solve for Dy right away. Well, that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and use these variables here to solve for um, Vy initial, okay? So I might use something like, uh, let's say, Vy equals Vy naught plus 
a y t and then just kind of rearrange that um actually i maybe i'll just point out that this v y is zero so get rid of u and then um rearrange this solve it algebraically and i get v y initial equals negative a y t and sub in my variables i get negative negative 9.8 times uh, 1.125. Remember, we have to use the halfway time because I'm talking about the y variables here. And uh, this gives me right around 12.25 uh, meters per second. That's my, that's my initial y velocity. That's great. I've got my initial y velocity. Um, I'm going to use that now to find my um, y displacement, my maximum y displacement. Um, and uh, I'll just make a note here. This is all solving problem A. So I could now use, uh, maybe I could just use V squared equals V naught squared plus 2AD and then solve that for D and I get D equals V uh, squared minus V naught squared all divided by 2A, which is, oh, I could have canceled that out, my zero. Forgot about that, that's all right. 12.25 squared divided by two times negative 9.8. Now something that's really useful to do, you could just take these numbers and start mashing them into your calculator and your calculator spit out an answer. You write it down, you give yourself a high five and you move on, but it's really easy to make mistakes especially when it comes to signs, right? So we're really being really careful with our negative signs because our vectors can be positive or negative, uh, or negative. And so we want to make sure that our answers make sense. So before you mash that into your calculator, um, maybe in your head you should have an idea, like what kind of number should I get for this vector? This displacement vector, what kind of number should it be? Well, um, it, is, it is upwards, right? They launched into the air, so the displacement should be positive. And when I look a little more closely here, I can see that what's going to happen is this, this little negative sign here, and this is really important, this little negative sign that's out front of the 12.25 is not going to get squared. What's being squared is 12.25. So that negative sign sits out front there. And that negative sign is going to cancel out with the negative sign below it. And so I can see that when I put this in my calculator, um, I should, I definitely should get a positive answer. And when I do, the answer comes out to be about 7.7 .7 meters. And when I think back to that video, 7.7 .7 meters, that actually sounds pretty feasible, right? That's pretty high in the air for a car to be jumping. Certainly went a lot further this way than he did that way, but um, still kind of impressive, okay? Um, so the next question here is, what velocity, part B is, what velocity did he leave the ramp? Well, I wanna come back to this vector diagram here because we did find out that the initial y velocity, I found that over here, that was 12.25 meters per second, but I don't know my x velocity. So maybe make a little note here. This is getting messy, but you don't mind. Then I'm gonna try and solve b now. What is the total velocity? And the total velocity is this one here. That's what I wanna know. How fast did he have to be going to get off that ramp? Um, luckily, if I jump over here to the x side of my table, and you might have noticed this a long time before I did, is that, look, I've got actually two of the three variables, so I can just go and find the other one. So vx is just equal to dx divided by t. So what is that? 87 divided by 2.25. And um, this works out to be right around 38... 0.6 meters per second. Notice that I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep a couple extra sig figs uh, because those aren't final numbers, and so I'm only gonna round off right at the end because I want to make sure that I that whoever solves this problem, the whatever number of sig figs you kind of carry, you kind of get the same number. So 38.6 meters per second. Awesome. So just about done. Look at me go. So last thing I gotta do here, I gotta do some Pythagoras find the total so I got V total squared equals VX squared plus VY naught squared and I'm gonna jump a little algebra step hopefully you're okay with that uh, V total is just the square root of 12.25 squared plus 38.6 squared. Oh, I switched my X and Y you don't mind that's okay and cranking through all the numbers I get 40.5 meters per second. That is a lot. I've done a lot of work and I'm very proud of myself and I'm just about to give myself a giant high five, uh, but something's not quite sitting right. 
and hopefully something's not quite sitting right with you as well. What's not sitting right is I didn't actually solve the problem, but I got so close. And maybe you've already realized what my mistake is here. This number, 40.5 meters per second, is a really good answer if they were asking for the speed, but they were asking for the velocity. So technically, technically I have to give the direction of that vector. And I can't just say, you know, sort of forward uppy as cars go jumping. Um, I, have to, I have to drill down and give them something more specific. And what we want to give, which is more specific, is we want to give this angle right here. Right? So whenever we have to give resultant, or I should say two-dimensional vectors, the way we give that direction is with an angle. Uh, and luckily I've got some trig in my back pocket just waiting to be used. So I guess maybe we'll use tan. Tan of theta is going to equal uh, vy naught over vx. And maybe I'll skip a step here because I'm running out of space. So inverse tan of 12.2. 12.25, sorry about that, divided by 38.6. And when I crank this through my calculator, I get, uh, what do I get? Right around 18, 18 degrees. Now you might be wondering, okay, well, how am I gonna specify that, that direction? And I'll say this, look, if you told me that, look, this is theta, and theta is 18 degrees, I think that's enough information. So if you wanna just box that out, and say, yep, yeah, well done. I guess if you want to say above the horizontal, you can be specific. But I think that's I think that's pretty good information, just the way it goes. Okay. Okay. So a quarterback launches the ball to a wide receiver, which is downfield, and they throw the ball at 12 meters per second, uh, at 35 degrees above the horizontal. So I've got a football here. And we're gonna launch it at 12 meters per second at an angle of 35 degrees above the horizontal. And that's gonna fly through the air, beautiful parabolic arc, and it's gonna be caught by a wide receiver. Now, a couple of things here, okay? Uh, I'm gonna make again a few assumptions. Like I'm gonna assume that whatever uh, level the ball was thrown at, that when it gets caught, it gets caught at the exact same level. And again, we could figure it out, but it's a little complicated. And again, we don't have enough information to do anything else. So the first question I see there is how far downfield is the receiver? Okay, so um, let's think about this for a second. So he throws the ball, it goes up in the air, it comes back down, and when it comes down, it's going like this, okay? So um, the first thing I want you to notice is that um, when I throw the ball, and I'm just gonna redraw this total vector here, there's my V total. Uh, the ball gets thrown again with both X velocity, so VX, and Y velocity vy, vy naught. Now think about for a second why we're making that distinction. I'm calling vx just plain old vx, but vy naught, I'm being very specific that it's vy naught. I wonder why it is I have to be specific about, uh, about that. Now this is 12 meters per second, and this here is 35 degrees. Lovely. Now think about this for a second. The ball goes up travels up in the air some distance, and then comes falling back down, and whatever distance it goes up, it falls back down that same distance. So when it comes back to this point right here, if you think about what we learned last unit, it must be traveling at the same speed, only downwards. So when the ball hits the ground here, that same total velocity should add back up to 12 meters per second, which means if I break down my landing velocity, I can break this down, into Vx and now Vy final, then those must be the same as well. Well, not the same exactly. This would be the same, and Vy would be just a little bit different. And you can see that Vy would be the same, it would just be in the negative direction, right? And so the total speed would be the same, but instead of the ball going upwards, now the ball's coming downwards because the Y component went from upwards to downwards. Okay, good stuff. So uh, I'm gonna set up my, my X, Y chart. Uh, I'm gonna set it up over here. So I'm gonna need that in a second. Okay, X and Y, and away I go. 
Now the thing about this, um, you can see we don't have a lot of information. The only thing we know about this is the speed and the angle that the ball was thrown at. Luckily, that's enough information for us to figure out a bunch, a bunch of stuff. So the first thing to notice is I can break this, once I've got this um, this vector diagram drawn out, I can break those components down, I can figure them out. Um, I'm going to kind of skip a step here, but basically Vy initial is just going to be um, 12 times the sine of 35 degrees, and Vx, that initial or really that constant x velocity, is going to be 12 times the cosine of 35 degrees. Um, now when I hammer those through my uh, calculator for x I get like 9.830 meters per second and in the y direction uh, I'm gonna get like 6.883 meters per second. And it's kind of annoying and if you wanted to just leave it as 12 sine 30 and carry that through that'd be fine but I'm gonna put it into numbers uh, because I like numbers. Uh, I just need to keep extra digits if I round it off now like seven, then I'm gonna get a totally different answer than somebody that doesn't round it off. So when I go over here and I start filling out my XY chart, I've got my VX, I've got my uh, DX, and I got my T, nice and simple. Right off the bat, well I know VX. VX is 9.830 meters per second. Uh, I don't know DX and I don't know T, so I'm gonna leave that blank for now. In the Y direction, I've got Vy, Vy naught, uh, Ay, Dy, and T. Now, in the last example, I looked at the halfway time. I kind of went, okay, well the ball went up in the air and then I uh, came back down, but we're gonna chop it in half and look at that. Um, you can do that in this problem. Um, in fact, we might have to in a second anyways, but I'm just gonna show you that we don't have to necessarily do that. We can do these problems um, by looking at the whole thing. So I'm actually gonna look at the Y direction all the way up and all the way down. I've already found the initial Y velocity is 6.883 meters per second, and I know my Y acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, if I think of the Y displacement, well, if I go all the way up and come all the way down, my Y displacement is gonna be zero. So even though I have those three variables, that's actually not gonna be super useful for solving um, anything. You'll see when I plug those into the big three formulas. However, what I talked about before becomes super relevant. If the ball goes up at 6.883 meters per second initially, then when it comes down, the final Y velocity is gonna be the exact same number, just negative, 6.883 meters per second. And so now I've got lots of variables and so I can find uh, time, which you can see I need to know the time because I need the time over here so that I can find my dx. Okay, so let's uh, let's do that. Let's maybe just use uh, v equals v naught plus a t and then solve that. t is going to equal v minus v naught divided by a. And so that's going to be negative 6.8 Eight three minus six point eight eight three and divide that by negative nine point eight. Now again, a good idea. Just think about what kind of number do I expect? Well, this is time. I'm kind of expecting time to be positive, and you can see these numbers on top negative minus a number. I'm going to get a big negative, and then I'm going to divide by negative. It's all going to work out great, and uh, I end up with a total time of one point four zero five seconds. So there's the time the ball spends in the air. I can now take this and bring this over here and solve for uh, dx. And I don't think I pointed this out from the beginning, but what we're trying to find here, how far downfield the ball goes, really that question was asking what is dx? I think I jumped over that part because I was so excited to get started. So solving here, I've got vx equals dx over t. Uh, so dx equals vx times t. So I guess that is 9.830 times, what did I find? 1.405. And um, solving all of this, we get right around 13.8. Uh, 13.81, let's call that, let's just round that off, it's the final answer, 14 meters. Put a nice box around that so I don't get confused later. So, wide receiver's 14 meters downfield, that seems like a reasonable distance to throw a football. Um, and now it's saying, okay, um, <clears throat> hold on a second, 
Question two, or uh, that was question A. Whoops, that was question A. Really should be better at labeling these things. Um, that was question A, and now I need to find question B. How high does the ball go? Hold on a second. How high the ball goes doesn't happen at the end. How high the ball goes happens right here at the middle. So really, this is dy. You might call this dy max. What is the maximum y displacement? displacement. Because when the ball goes up and back down, the y displacement is zero. So the maximum y displacement, well, that doesn't happen at the end. That happens halfway through. So this is a situation where maybe I got to this point and I go, you know what, I kind of do need to talk about the halfway time. So what I might do is I might go over here to my chart and I might uh, just extend my chart a little bit here whoop, and make another y at t one half, where I just look at y at the halfway time. So I've got vy at the halfway time will be zero. Vy initial is still 6.883 meters per second. Ay is just always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Dy is, I don't know, uh, and ty, t one half, sorry, is just 1.45 divided by 2, which I think worked out to be about 0 0.7025 seconds. Okay, And so now I can use this information here uh, to solve for my dy. So um, let's see, maybe we'll just use uh, d equals v naught t plus 1 half a t squared. And I'm very much running out of space, so I'm not going to put in all the numbers, but I think you should. And then you should write that down on your paper because you left yourself way more space. And um, the numbers actually come out to be 2.4 meters, which again, that's a nice reasonable number to throw a ball 14 meters down the field, two and a half meters up, up in the air. That seems reasonable. Okay, um, last thing here. At what other angle could the quarterback have thrown the ball and reached the same displacement? Now, this is something that hopefully you kind of discovered when you did the notes earlier on the projectile concepts. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the answer. Um, because that's what this is for. But uh, I do want you to think about why this answer works. And the answer is that if you throw a ball over level ground, then if you throw the ball at two complementary angles, they're going to have the same range, which is saying that if instead of throwing it at 35, if I throw it at the exact, exact same speed, I still throw it at a total speed of 12 meters per second. But instead, this angle right here, and I'm just going to draw my components. That angle right there between my Vx and my hypotenuse. Just hold on a second. Vy naught. This angle right here needs to be 55 degrees. And then that means that these two balls thrown will end up the same distance downfield. They will have the same Dx. Now, they won't have everything in common. For example, the second throw will spend a lot more time in the air. It'll take a lot longer to get there. It's going to loft way up and then come way down. But it's still only going to end up at the same spot downfield, and that's worth thinking about. If it spends so much time in the air, why doesn't it go further? Well, one of the things you might have noticed already is that the reason that, or one of the reasons that the complementary angle matters is that if this first, in this triangle, if this was 35, then this angle here was 55. And in the second triangle, if that's 55, then this other angle here is 35. These are actually, they're not the same vector diagrams, but they're the same triangles, or similar triangles, which means whatever I got for my y, initial y velocity, that's now my x velocity. And whatever I got for my x velocity, that's now my y velocity. I flipped the two. And the short version of this is that essentially, this second throw spends much more time in the air because it's got a bigger vy. But it's not going as fast in the x direction. Now, um, if you don't believe me, uh, you're right. You shouldn't just believe everything you hear on the internet. Why don't you take those numbers, crunch them through these formulas over here, and see what you get. And I think you'll find that you get a different time, but you get the same, uh, you get the same dx. Okay, uh, that is it for type 2 projectiles.